I'm Dr. Sylvia Forney, ROM Senior Curator of Global Africa, and I'm delighted you could join us for today's ROM Connects program, producing partnership with the Jackson Park Project. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Odenoshone Confederacy, the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. In a moment, we will broadcast a pre-recorded presentation curated by the Jackson Park Project and hosted by Audra Yolanda Gray. Thank you to everyone joining us today. My name is Audra Yolanda Gray, and I'm the series creator and research for the Jackson Park Project, an initiative aimed to memorialize and celebrate the history of the Emancipation Day celebrations that took place in Windsor, Ontario between the 30s and 60s. We are developing educational resources in a digital archive, which we hope will lay a foundation for a dramatic series that challenges us to reflect on freedom, identity, and civil rights in Canada. The aim of the Jackson Park Project is to take Canadians on a journey to explore and courageously reimagine a new vision of our collective identity. For far too long, Canadian history has been interpreted from the perspective of what was termed the founding cultures, British and French. Recently, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has challenged us to see Canadian history beyond these two lenses. Similarly, the story of Jackson Park challenges us to see that Black history is also Canadian history. Addressing this twofold purpose of one of the largest freedom movements in history will be Natasha Henry, President of the Ontario Black History Society, who will be focusing on the history of emancipation celebrations and their relevance to ongoing issues of racism in Canada. Our second speaker, Irene Moore Davis, president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, will focus on what was known as the greatest freedom show on earth, the, the celebrations in Windsor, Ontario, and their ongoing connections to issues we are seeing today. We are incredibly delighted and grateful to have this opportunity to share an exciting side of our Canadian history today at the ROM. We want to extend our welcome to you as we travel forward together on this journey. So, Natasha Henry, thank you for being with us today. Um, it's so wonderful to have you. Um, so, tell us a little bit more about this history. Um, this history, Emancipation Day celebrations. Tell us a little bit more. Hi, Audra. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here with you and Irene, and i um, happy to be here to share a bit about the history of Emancipation Day celebrations in Canada. Uh, this year marks 10 years since my book, Emancipation Day, Celebrating Freedom in Canada. And, you know, even though it's been out for 10 years, uh, there really has been ongoing learning around this history. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit of that with you today. Emancipation Day is on August 1st, 1834, and it marks the abolition of slavery throughout most of the British colonies, including here in Canada. And what is not well known is that the Abolition Act, the Slavery Abolition Act was relevant here in Canada because slavery was practiced for over 200 years in Canada, beginning with the French um, colonists and subsequently with the, the British colonists. And so African peoples and indigenous peoples were forced to labor for the growth of um, personal wealth and for the colony. And um, this happened across the, from Nova Scotia, moving westward into Quebec, Nova, um, New Brunswick, and into Ontario. And so for over 206 years, uh, African men, women, and children here um, enslaved in what we now call Canada, as I mentioned, were, were forced to, to work. And this practice was upheld by several pieces of legislation. 
And as a British colony, uh, this is something that as um, that this is something that was common practice and something the practice that was uh, expected is part of the process of empire building and colonization. Here is a piece of legislation uh, in 1790 that encourages uh, colonial settlers to import enslaved Africans and that they would be allowed to do so duty free. In 1793, an, an act of um, an act was passed, uh, the Act to Limit Slavery here in Upper Canada, and that gradually phased out enslavement. But what it also did is that it also uh, ensured, it confirmed that slavery remained uh, a practice in 1793, and that those who were held enslaved, that they would continue to be enslaved unless those that enslaved them uh, manumitted them. And so by the time we get to 1833, there were a handful of uh, Africans who were enslaved. One of the examples quickly was a young boy by the name of Tom, who was 15 in 1824. And the, the gentleman who enslaved him, Mr. Keeler, he hired him out. He sold him in a contract for 10 years. And that brought him up to the age of 25, which is when the legislation would free him. And um, that also brought him to 1834 as well. And so that was just one example that we've been able to find uh, to speak to the longevity of the practice of slavery in Canada. And so when the bill, um, when the legislation passes, it does indeed become a day of celebration. Um, and over time, it was celebrated across the country in several places, um, such as the ones that I've listed here. These are some of the main locations across the country where Emancipation Day celebrations were held. And we will speak to that a little bit more. So how do, what did Emancipation Day look like um, over time? There is evidence, uh, again, in my research of an Emancipation Day celebration taking place on the very day that the bill took effect on August 1st, 1834 in Montreal. And celebrations sprung up, um, as I mentioned, across uh, the country, and particularly in places where there were higher concentrations of, um, of people of African descent. The celebrations um, were organized by a number of people. Here is one of them, Henry Bibb, who would cross over and live in, um, in the Windsor area. And he um, and his wife, uh, Mary Bibb, they um, published a newspaper, The Voice of the, Free, uh, Voice of the Fugitive, and his wife operated a school. And he was very active in helping to uh, resettle uh, freedom seekers here in, in, in Canada, uh, in the Windsor area. And he was one of the organizers of Emancipation Day on both sides of the river, which I'm sure Irene will talk a little bit more about um, the Windsor area specifically. This is Josiah Henson. And Josiah Henson, he was, um, again, another freedom seeker and a very strong community leader. And he was also responsible for helping to organize Emancipation Day celebrations in the Dawn Settlement, which is now in the Dresden area. Here is B.J. Uh, Spencer Pitt, another um, organizer. Uh, as Emancipation Day celebrations evolved into larger picnics, larger gatherings, uh, he was responsible uh, um, as the president of the U uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association in Toronto. They were responsible for organizing Emancipation Day celebrations at Port Dalhousie in the St. Catharines area. And he did that for a number of years in the um, 1940s and 50s. Here is um, an example of a group of women here in Windsor in 1954. The theme was around women's contributions and women issues. And you know, since the inception of Emancipation Day celebrations, women were involved, but it's not something that was always readily documented um, in, you know, across the country. And so here in Windsor, we see uh, this cross-border event of women um, you know, being involved, not just behind the scenes, but also front and center of of Emancipation Day celebrations. And if you can imagine, here we are in 2020, and you know, for us to get information out about an event, you know, 
we able to use social media and email, we have TV um, commercials, but just think about from in the 1800s going up into the 20th century, that Emancipation Day was able to attract hundreds and thousands of people, and they traveled by whatever means, by steamers, you know, horse and buggy, um, the railway, uh, by cars when they became, um, when they started to be produced. And so you really see how people were just moving around, um, gathering for this special occasion. So some key features of Emancipation Day celebrations were uh, church services. Oftentimes, uh, the day began with sunrise church services from one of the many um, Black churches in different communities. And here are a few. Here's the um, SR Drake Memorial Church in Brantford. There were also celebrations in Oakville as well. So the African Methodist Episcopal Churches and the British Methodist Episcopal Churches, um, they hosted uh, front, uh, as I said, um, early morning services and were also places where people would then return for different social gatherings as well to mark the day. Another key element of Emancipation Day was recognizing and honoring um, the British crown for ending, for abolishing slavery. And so there was this element of patriotism that we see co coming through some streams of Emancipation Day celebrations. And oftentimes there was, um, you know, honor and appreciation bestowed uh, upon the queen. Here we see a toast in Toronto in 1854, uh, celebrations um, that attracted people from Hamilton and the Windsor area and other locales. Um, you know, again, here as an example, uh, toasting the queen, three chairs for the queen, um, different uh, elements of the government, the provincial new freeman, the newspaper, um, and the president who was likely Marianne Shad by that time. And, again, resolving to celebrate together at another location in Hamilton. And of course, remembering their wives and sweethearts um, at the end of their toast. Another feature of Emancipation Day celebrations were speakers. The speakers came from all around, local speakers and um, in US speakers and from other places as well. Frederick Douglass attended Emancipation Day celebrations at the Dom Settlement in 1852. Mifflin Gibbs was a community leader in um, British Columbia, and he was also important in organizing Emancipation Day celebrations there when Blacks from Carolina, um, California uh, moved to um, British Columbia beginning in 1858. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an invited speaker at Windsor's um, celebrations as well. Reverend Henry Grasset, um, he was the pastor at St. James Cathedral, downtown Toronto. He was involved in Emancipation Day celebrations as a speaker and helping to host different events for over 20 years. Um, and so we see there's also uh, some elements of interracial celebrations of Emancipation Day celebrations um, and the push as well to um, abolish slavery in the United States. Joseph Isobanian, his father was a freedom seeker. He was born in Brantford and he became a pastor of the BME church and leader of um, the Jubilee Singers. And he was also an integral person in, in organizing um, Emancipation Day celebrations across the province. In 1938, Marcus Garvey was a guest, a guest at Emancipation Day celebrations at Port de Luzi, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, organized under the auspices of the UNIA, which Marcus Garvey and his wife were founders of. And uh, here we see this transnational element, again, of Emancipation Day celebrations. Marcus Garvey from Jamaica, there were, um, you know, slavery was abolished. In, in Jamaica as well, although they had four years of apprenticeships up until 1838. So we see these political and these social connections in Emancipation Day celebrations. 
one of the elements of emancipation, features of Emancipation Day that I love are the parades. And we think about, you know, in 18, in the 1800s that Black people were taking up public space, taking up the streets at a time where, and even to today where, you know, Black bodies are often marked in, in, in a negative way to, in, when, in taking up public um, spaces. Here is a parade, a sketch of a parade in London, Ontario in 1896. That was in the newspaper. And here is a lovely picture of young girls um, marching in a parade in Windsor. And then in the Someone's night at front door. And then in the 1950s, um, here was a parade of some black veterans uh, marching in the streets. As part of those parades, musical bands from all over would perform and play music. Um, here we just as a couple of examples again, um, in terms of how diverse emancipation celebrations were. Here is the French Dukes Precision Drill Team uh, from the Detroit area and the Oneida Native Brass Band um, out of the, the Haldeman area, the Six Nations. Uh, afterwards, with the, after the parades, people would convene together and um, partake in a range of social activities, feasts and dancing. And here is just an example, the cakewalk was such a popular dance at the ending of um, the, the 1800s. And this was something, the competition that was quite popular in Emancipation Day celebrations. And as time evolved, uh, the, the element of um, even though political activism continued to be a part of it, um, there it began to be relaxed in some places and began to be uh, more of a family gathering in some locations. Here are some photos of Emancipation Day celebrations in Owen Sound, who this year are celebrating, are marking 158 years of consecutive Emancipation Day celebrations, which is remarkable. And here is um, a, a clip of a family, the Bartons, a large black family uh, who entered into Ontario as freedom seekers and the children dispersed in different places, including Toronto. And here we have in the, new, the newspaper, the Bradley Conservator having the notice that the family is coming together, family and friends, over 200 people to mark Emancipation Day in 1898. And in the marking uh, Emancipation Day, um, marking the end of, um, of slavery and ushering a life into freedom, unfortunately, even in marking that occasion, um, Black people, Black Canadians uh, experienced racism while celebrating Emancipation Day. And uh, there was an event in Leamington where uh, those who were celebrating at a park were targeted um, by police and had a, a very unfortunate experience, something that I talk about more in my book. But this was just an example, again, of how the day continues to be an ongoing um, fight for equality and to be treated fairly. So out of Emancipation Day, and uh, out of Emancipation Day, the end of slavery in 1830s, although people felt that slavery was abhorrent and ended it by legislation, it didn't necessarily change the um, ideologies and the beliefs that people have regarding um, people of African descent. And so they were not necessarily viewed as equal um, to white Canadians. And we see that in how immediately after um, the end of slavery, how Black Canadians were treated and the ongoing struggle for full freedom and racial equality. And I'll just share a, a few quick instances. Uh, here we see in 1842, a mere six years after the abolition of slavery, that segregated schools start to spring up in um, in Ontario and in different places um, in Nova Scotia as well, places with highly concentrated Black populations. In the eight, in 1850, early in the 1850, there, although Black men could vote um, legally, they were sometimes uh, Inter they were sometimes interrupted from actually exercising their right to vote by white citizens. And this is something that Samuel Wingo Ward talked about in the Provincial Freeman. And then as it relates to employment, this was an area 
and it still today continues to be an area that Black Canadians, you know, face racial discrimination or are often excluded. Um, here is Albert Jackson in 1880, 1882, Toronto's first Black postal carrier, and it caused um, such an uproar uh, in the Black community and in the Toronto area as well. And um, because it was an election year, politicians intervened and asked him to be um, trained because the Black communities were agitating and demanding that he take up this post as a way to address, you know, racial just discrimination more broadly. And they were successful in doing that. Immigration is also another area, um, you know, where Black Canadians, people of African descent, although British col uh, colonists were welcome to immigrate to Canada, not, it would, didn't apply to those who were from places with a large Black populations. And so, in, and then in 1911, there was an attempt to close the doors to um, people from the United States, from uh, African Americans, and Black people from other places from entering. Canada. And this again remained uh, an area of ongoing uh, struggle by Black Canadians. And then there's the military. Uh, and uh, we here is a, a picture of um, the number two construction battalion. It was a segregated unit because of, um, you know, the initial exclusion uh, to enlist in the Canadian military and then subsequently was allowed to black men from across Canada had to enlist um, mostly in this in this unit as well and so this is an area um, again that speaks to an, a, how black Canadians were continuing to agitate for, for full freedom and then again in education an example of nursing schools and black women being barred from attending nursing school um, in the 1940s into the 1950s and this is one nurse Marie Scott who was allowed to um, to join the nursing school at Guelph after a lot of community mobilizing um, and slowly opened the doors for other um, black women to attend nursing schools and then residential discrimination, housing discrimination, where Black people and other um, racialized groups were barred from purchasing properties in certain locations. So when we look at these things and, and you know, when we're looking at where Black people reside and where they're not, um, you know, there's an element of this um, that, that plays out as well, um, as, as well as other groups as it relates to, you know, the exclusion of, of people of African descent. And often at times, um, you know, throughout throughout the years, that there's been this element of of racial terror um, as a way to to let black people know that they were not welcome or that you know they should not they were not considered to be part of the Canadian fabric, and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, similar to the United States, was a, a common group, was a popular group um, that was used uh, as a way to make to communicate those messages. So it's part of Emancipation Day celebrations as well and the ongoing push for racial equality. Uh, Black Canadians would agitate for legislation that, um, you know, that forced companies and, and businesses to treat them with human rights. And out of this, um, you know, this agitation by people like Hugh Burnett, Barmley Armstrong, Ruth Lore here, um, you know, who did a lot of activist work in the Dresden and Chatham area, we get uh, legislate our first legislations, uh, the Ontario Fair Accommodation Practices Act in 1954. And then some of these legislations rolled into the Ontario Human Rights code. And oftentimes, you, you know, looking at this brief background, you know, there's this idea that a lot of these common elements, these, these, this common practice of racial segregation didn't take place in Canada, but we indeed have our own history of um, racial discrimination and anti-Black racism in, in a systemic way. And this is something that was expressed in Emancipation Day celebrations. Here is a replica of a, of a sign that was carried at a parade in Emancipation Day in the 1950s, paralleling to the American uh, civil rights movement. 
And so in, in, in all of these cases, there's ongoing individual resistance to anti-Black racism and the communities coming together to, um, to fight uh, anti-Black racism and to push for change. And Emancipation Day celebration was a part of that. And just one example before I wrap up was in Chatham in 1891, when they came together on, for Emancipation Day, they resolved that they passed a resolution that they would not march in a parade to celebrate, but they would march to protest um, segregated schools. And they did that on that occasion in that year, and they continued to fight throughout the next year and a half until eventually um, the schools were became integrated in, in, 19, in 1893. And so this is just one way how we see that although the day marked the occasion of abolishing slavery, it, it also marks an ongoing um, struggle and movement for full uh, equity and racial justice. And as we have this event today um, in the summer of the uprising of Black Lives Matter, we see that the struggle continues and that some of these elements continue to be of concern to Black Canadians, to communities across the countries. But it also very much is something that is involved in a global um, condition of people of African descent that we continue to agitate for change. And so Emancipation Day is just part of that continuum of that movement. Great. Thank you so much, Natasha, for sharing that uh, overview of the, the Emancipation Day celebrations. Um, and so now we turn to Irene Moore Davis uh, with an exclusive focus on Windsor. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm delighted to share some information about the emancipation celebrations that happened through the years here in Windsor, Ontario. They were a massive endeavor. They drew individuals from all over the Midwest region and Ontario, and they were crafted in a very special way between the 1930s and 1960s with a very specific focus on showing people of African descent in the light in which we deserved to be shown. Here, you're seeing a picture from one of the emancipation celebrations here in Windsor when someone very special came to visit, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, sorry, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And he is there accompanied by Walter Perry, who was known as Mr. Emancipation because he was the chair of our annual celebrations for about 30 years. And Russell Small, who was the president of the board of the British American Association of Colored Brethren, and a gentleman named Reverend Boone from Detroit, showing the transnational nature of our celebrations here in Windsor. Before I go forward, I want to call attention to the great loss that has happened to the Black community in Windsor this week um, in the person of Naomi Banks. Naomi Banks was someone who organized the musical, the gospel music component of our emancipation celebrations here for years, especially in this century. Um, many people don't realize throughout the province and elsewhere that emancipation celebrations have continued here in Windsor, although in a modified and somewhat truncated form from the way that they were years ago. But Naomi Banks was a great concert master and choir mistress, and she was very instrumental in organizing annual gospel celebrations for August 1st, uh, year after year, including in the last several years, a beautiful event held in Jackson Park called Gospel in the Garden. So rest in peace, Naomi Banks. So the Windsor Emancipation celebrations that were held specifically between the years 1935 and the late 60s especially, but into the 1970s as well, were very popular events. And if you ask anyone from this region, from this end of the province, as well as people from the Metro Detroit area, they will often describe the Emancipation celebrations in terms of the great parades that happened and the Miss Sepia contest, which was this amazing celebration of black beauty and female excellence that happened every year. And obviously the very famous barbecue pits. Uh, there were great barbecue competitions and amazing food that were part of this celebration for decades. And it was really something that was designed to celebrate black excellence and to bring, to bring people of various backgrounds together. It was not merely a celebration and it was not merely a protest. 
It was both of those things, but it was also very deliberately fashioned to bring together black and white community members and to lead them to embrace one another and to engage in intercultural understanding. So it was very interesting that there were diversity and inclusion goals expressed in this way. And when we look at the way that the founders of the major portion of the Emancipation Celebration here in Windsor crafted their plans, they used very aspirational language. So I do want to talk a little bit about the very serious elements, the very uh, deliberate and social justice elements of the Windsor Emancipation Celebrations and how they tied into the struggle against anti-Black racism. And that's really a reason why Emancipation Celebrations need to continue today. So as you, as you probably know, emancipation was celebrated throughout uh, Canada um, for a very long time. And, and this is a very famous photo from Amherstburg. Um, and here in Windsor and Essex County, there were celebrations right from the start. They were especially uh, well populated and very uh, fun celebrations held in Sandwich, which is now part of West Windsor. Um, here in Windsor itself, the celebrations have kind of fizzled out uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And there was a desire to really re-energize and regenerate that celebration in the 1930s. And that came in the person of Walter Perry, who was known as Mr. Emancipation. Walter Perry was an independent entrepreneur um, and a man of African descent who had not had an opportunity to acquire a great deal of education because he needed to quit school and take care of his family as a boy, but he had a brilliant mind and a real drive um, and a determination to do right by his people. So he was very instrumental in 1935 in founding an organization called the British American Association of Colored Brethren. And that, uh, that name really suggests the transnational nature of this celebration that took place over the next several decades. There were individuals from Ontario who were present, but there were also often individuals from Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, New York State, and places even farther away who came annually to these celebrations. And as I'll show you later, there were also a great many civil rights leaders and others who came from throughout the United States to be part of the celebrations. So, this individual, Walter Perry, and his board of directors and all of the volunteers, they were very determined to use emancipation celebrations to show African Canadians in the light in which they deserve to be shown. And also to breed understanding between white and black citizens. But above that, they also wanted to encourage communication between people of African descent throughout North America. And for that reason, it was very important to bring in guest speakers and leaders from the United States to sort of light the fire, ignite the uh, social justice components of our local communities and engage in those conversations that would help the global struggle for African rights move forward. Walter Perry was known as Mr. Emancipation, uh, and he had his hands in all kinds of things. The Emancipation celebrations here in Windsor consisted not only of the things I've mentioned, but also massive entertainment programs, guest speakers, a religious program that happened every, uh, every year on the Sunday, midway activities, and Freedom Awards. Walter Perry would give out Freedom Awards to people of African descent and people of European descent who were deemed as either promoting black excellence, exemplifying black excellence, or promoting intercultural understanding. So people who received those freedom awards included many of the civil rights leaders that you'll see later in this presentation, but also individuals like the great labor leader from uh, Detroit, Walter Ruther, the mayor of Windsor, Art Reham, who was responsible for bringing a lot of employees of African descent into the municipal services, and others who were leaders in the community or who had achieved excellence. People like Dr. Henry David Taylor, who not only was a physician, but was the first black chair of our Windsor Board of Education. So these were the kinds of people receiving awards. Oh, and I should mention Alton Parker, Canada's first black detective here from Windsor. 
So Walter Perry often wrote editorials in a magazine known as Progress that was part of the Emancipation Celebration. It was sold every year as a fundraiser, but also to record what was happening. It contained the program for the actual festival, but it also contained articles and information about people who were doing well, people who were achieving many firsts, both locally and throughout North America as people of African descent. And it contained a bit of an editorial every year that focused on some of the, the continuing issues that were being dealt with in terms of anti-Black racism and what some of the solutions might look like. So in those progress magazines, you hear Walter Perry using language such as, I want to plan an emancipation celebration, which will be a credit to the race. He talks about assisting in developing the interests of the Negro, in, including the promotion of amic amicable relations and understanding between the Negro and other races. He talks about uplifting the community of African descent. He talks about white people and colored people living side by side in peace and happiness. He talks about things like the future of the colored man is brighter now than it has ever been. We have our doctors, lawyers, actors, scientists, journalists. In every profession, we have leaders who rank within the leaders of any race. So very aspirational language was often used, and it was really an opportunity to motivate and ignite the community at large. It's very interesting that uh, Dr. Henry David Taylor was, was not only someone who was given an award, but was also very much a part of the Emancipation Planning Committee, and he was a person of excellence for sure. I think that when we look at images like this, one of the things that you'll notice in terms of Windsor's grand emancipation celebrations is that it's a very multicultural crowd in attendance. And really, if you talk today to anyone who's over the age of about 60 and who grew up here in Windsor or in our region, they are very much aware and have memories of having enjoyed these parades and these barbecues and the midway and, and the singing competitions and all of the things that went with it. And it really lent itself to a spirit of uh, com a community and people getting along and collaboration. It was a great time in which uh, it was possible to celebrate Black youth as well. And they were often very instrumental in the talent competitions, the parade, and other things. And many of our people of African descent who are elders now remember fondly their childhood and youth and, and those amazing experiences they had at Windsor's Emancipation Festivals. In 1953, um, Walter Perry's tone in the Emancipation Progress magazine began to change a little. He, he started to use a little bit less aspirational uh, language and to focus more on the problems that were occurring for people of African descent, not only here in Canada, but in the United States. The civil rights movement was certainly becoming much more um, widely known. And of course, there were struggles against segregation and discrimination here in Canada, and especially in southwestern Ontario, that were really um, seizing or capturing everyone's attention. So emancipation became much more an opportunity to talk about those things with a, a great group of thousands of people of African descent gathered from both sides of the border. It was a time to discuss solutions, and that was a very important component. So in 1953, he wrote, each year we issue a call to men of good faith to join the crusade of interracial understanding. Answer this call not by word of mouth, not by loud and lavish display, but by your actions in your day-to-day -day living. We like to think these celebrations have helped in some small way. It is our aim and ambition to show our people in the light in which they deserve to be shown as an enlightened, advanced, educated, thinking, progressive, patriotic people. And this is one of the early programs from 1937 when Jackson Park was first used uh, for the emancipation celebrations. And it's so exciting that there's such a focus on returning to Jackson Park for further celebrations and possibly even a monument in Jackson Park is being discussed, as well as, of course, the very interesting Jackson Park Entertainment Project that's now being discussed. This is one of the uh, 
favorite, one of my favorite covers of Progress Magazine. It features a young African American boxer, but it really shows in such a beautiful way the pursuit of achievement and excellence, doesn't it? So many great leaders were brought to emancipation, not only our African Canadian leaders, but people from the United States. We have people coming like Mary McLeod Bethune, my goodness. We have uh, a, a lot of focus on people locally in both Windsor and the Detroit area who are doing amazing things. And people like Marian Anderson and their achievements farther afield. There was a great deal of excitement when Windsor obtained its first uh, city solicitor of color, Mr. James Watson. And when Cecile Wright became the first Windsor woman of African descent to become a nurse. There were many, many uh, very interesting speakers such, such as Benjamin Hooks. Obviously, Martin Luther King was here, but we also had people like William Holmes Borders and Adam Clayton Powell and Benjamin Mays and Fred Shuttlesworth and many others who were part of this amazing celebration. And when they came, they didn't only give a speech. They came and participated in discussions with local leaders of African descent. And it was a really critical time in terms of organizing and sharing ideas. But they weren't just coming here to talk to the African Canadians. They were coming to Windsor celebrations to talk to the many African Americans who were also in attendance and to garner support for the civil rights movement and to share what was really happening on the ground. So that was highly significant as a part of emancipation. And so many others, Ralph Abernathy was here, just an amazing array of individuals coming across. Unfortunately, in 1967, emancipation was canceled in the wake of the Detroit uprising due to the city's fears, due to our city's uh, fears about many people of African descent gathering that summer. The person who was scheduled to speak that year was Julian Bond, and unfortunately, he did not make it here. But there are so many overwhelmingly beautiful memories of emancipation. And I must say, here in Windsor, it still continues in a somewhat modified and decreased form. But everyone is so grateful for the example that was set by these individuals who ran emancipation from the 1930s through the 1960s and the incredible work that they did, not just in terms of having a great celebration, but in terms of community building, capacity building, celebrating black excellence. And here I want to call attention to the successor of Walter Perry, Mr. Ted Powell, who also did a great job trying to revive or keep alive the emancipation celebrations in the 1970s. Unfortunately, it did trickle down to a, a much uh, lesser celebration eventually, especially after it was forced to leave Jackson Park, where it had been held for so many years and moved out to the west side of the town. It, uh, a little bit more difficult to gather so much support for the event at that point. But we are so grateful for the amazing examples that were set and the commitment to Black excellence that was shown. And it's certainly everyone's hope that Emancipation Day will be celebrated across this land and perhaps given national recognition very soon. Thank you so much. And thank you, Irene, for that exclusive look at Windsor. Uh, a sincere thank you to our partners at the ROM, Dr. Sylvia Forney and events coordinator Erin Kerr for their support and generosity in hosting this event. Uh, a special thank you to our, our speakers, Natasha Henry and Irene Moore Davis for sharing their lifelong dedication to enriching our understanding of Canadian history. And a thank you to Catherine, Catherine McDonald, Faven Ibera, uh, members of the Jackson Park team. And finally, we just want to thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We'd like to invite you to continue on this journey by following us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We hope to see you on August 5th for part two of our Emancipation Day series.